All right, everyone, might as well get started on time here. Welcome to the CDC panel. Time for me to go away. Is anybody out there who was here uh, 20 years ago at DEF CON 7? Might have seen these guys. Show of hands. Raise your hand. Pretty good. Well, wow. well, I saw it. <laughs> I, I saw it. They were awesome. Yeah, they were great. <laughs> All I right. Should listen to those dudes. This is like the 727, like DEF CON 7, DEF CON 27. As long you, as we're not the 737 max, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, thanks for showing up. Um, I'm really excited about this. Um, this is the, the largest CDC assemblage on a panel uh, in close time. to 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, so, I miss uh, you guys. <laughs> Just briefly introducing folks here. I mean, you can read the bios and stuff. Um, I'm Joe Mann. I'm a reporter, uh, and I wrote a book about these guys, um, which I hope you read. Um, this is Death Veggie. Um, Luke Benfies, his actual name. Oh God! <laughs> uh, Minister of Propaganda uh, for Cult of Dead Cow, and he's got like a regular security job uh, too. Uh, next is is uh, Omega. <laughs> The elusive. It's, he says this is his first hacker con in, in close to 20 years. So show him some love, please. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Oh. So if you, if you read CDC text files once upon a time or more recently, the odds are pretty good that Misha w edited the, them. And he also um, invented the word hacktivism, which uh, continues to resonate today. And if you're a fan of the six million, six million dollar man. Oh, yeah. A good file. <laughs> uh, and the clean, the clean cut looking gentleman is some dude named Mudge. Um, <laughs> um, living, living legend, uh, former uh, DARPA cybersecurity czar, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Frequent keynote speaker here, and just all around inspiration. Inventor of the cyber fast track at DARPA, which gave like government money <laughs> to people like you. To go find cool shit, <laughs> um, and and uh, and then finally Chris Rue uh, Dildog, uh, the the man who wrote Bo2K, released yeah. here 20 years ago. Uh, more recently, birthed some unicorn called Veracode, <laughs> um, which is Davos company. So. Uh, if they were most famous 20 years ago, why would I write a book? Why, you know, about them now? Why would we all be gathered here today? Um, uh, it's a good question. There are actually uh, three reasons. One is um, they're still around today, and they go back to the mid 80s. So it's a, they're a skeleton key for like all of the the major turns in infosec and hacking through that time. You, you don't have to go back and read 30 years worth of Usenet posts. You can if you want to. But you don't have to to get the you know the essence of the major leaps forward um, in infosec. That's one reason. Uh, the second reason is my last book was depressing as hell. Um, it was called Fatal System Error, and it was about basically how we're all screwed because security is hopeless and the Russians hate us and they don't care about crime and all this other stuff. All of which is still true. Um, I don't want to give you the idea that we're not no, no, screwed. No, no, the Kremlin dislikes us. The Russians are fine people. Russians right? are nice folks. Um, but it, you know, it was a downer. Um, and um, you know, if I only got to write one book on cybersecurity, I would probably write a downer. I would say they, we're, we're basically screwed. But I get to write two. It turns out I lived long enough to write another one. Um, and I wanted to do something positive. Something so here's something that works. Uh, here's something that's worth emulating um, and, and worth trying. Um, and the third reason is that CDC has, I think, at least three key qualities that are, are really, really important uh, that I want to get out there into the world, particularly to folks that weren't around back in the day. The most important is critical thinking. I, I feel like we're like have a worldwide crisis in the lack of critical thinking. We have people who believe that the world is flat. Um, and I don't think we're going to get, you know, the Department of Education to parachute philosophy professors into school districts around the country to teach them critical thinking. Um, so we have to find some other way of celebrating uh, and holding uh, this quality up. And all good hackers are, by definition, critical thinkers. You know, because you're looking at a system and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to make it do something it wasn't designed to do, uh, to see if that works. Um, and we need that in all in all walks of life more than ever right now. 
The second is they had one or more moral causes driving them. It varied over the years. It varied based on the individual. Uh, pursuit of knowledge, spreading of knowledge, human rights. Um, there were many moral causes and I think that's really fundamental and is also getting lost today. Um, and, and the third, uh, the third thing is that they're adaptable. They, the CDC morphed so many times. It started, you know, bulletin board operators, text files that were funny, sometimes obscene, um, some written by President Kennedy. Um, and, and, um, and then, and, you know, and then there was like the, the sort of tech influx and they managed to slap Microsoft around until uh, they got uh, this court certified monopoly to take security more seriously. <laughs> uh, and then they did uh, amazing things since then in the in public sector, Mudge and others, uh, private sector, Dildog and others, and keeping the, the, the idea of hacktivism uh, alive in the private sector, excuse me, in the nonprofit sector and, and um, sort of garden variety uh, activism. Um, and they, they've done all those amazing things. So I, I think as stuff gets weirder and harder in this world, um, the ability to adapt, the ability to say, well, I know this thing, I'm going to keep these values and I'm going to try this totally new terrain, learn how to mess with the media, learn how to talk to Congress. I think that's essential now uh, as we're dealing with info ops and all this other stuff that none of us have a background in. I think it's really important to be able to do that. So without further ado, I want to sort of go through the chronologi chronology here reasonably quickly. Um, it's like to have Q and A at the end, and I want to talk about have everybody talk about, you know, the way forward when we're done. So um, we we'll start off with uh, with uh, Luke here, Veggie. Uh, give us a little bit of the history, Lubbock. You know, where did CDC come from, and when did you run into it? Uh, well, Cult of the Dead Cow uh, came out of uh, Lubbock, Texas, in the mid '80s. It was founded by. Woohoo! More into the mic. Uh, more into the mic. <laughs> Came, in, came out of Lubbock, Texas in the, in the mid-80s. It was founded by uh, three punk kids, Swamp Rat, Frank and Jibe, and uh, the elusive Sid Vicious. Yeah. Um, uh, Sid Vicious was only temporarily involved with it, and then his parents took his modem away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the other guys started to, you know, spread around bulletin boards within Texas, and then further out, publishing text files, sort of uh, developing a network of, of other BBSs that would, uh, would uh, sort of publish and release CDC files because they framed it as a, you know, you get to release CDC files. We'll put you in, you know, we'll, you'll be a member of the KCAL force. And being a member of the KCAL force means you're allowed to release CDC files. And people are like, oh yeah, I want to be allowed to release CDC files. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, as I say, started in Texas, but by the, uh, by the late 80s had started, has had spread much further. Uh, I grew up outside of Boston. Um, I, whoo, <laughs> I had been, a, um, I'd been exposed to CDC through, uh, through their text files um, as far back as 87. Um, so they were, you know, they were a group I was aware of and, and, and looked up to. I started to talk to, to various members on BBSs. Then I started to allegedly set up hypothetically illegal phone systems to talk to them and so that they could talk to each other and eventually I was invited to join. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was in 91, I believe. Yeah, these Codes. are my people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, after that, you know, I, so I, I would say that I think it's, it's probably to say that I was part of the sort of the second generation of CDC after the, the, the really early members, including uh, uh, Obscure Images, who's here um, uh, today, uh, had sort of really blazed, blazed the trail. Um, so, uh, you know, from the very beginning, I looked up to CDC and I, I'm still immensely proud to, to be a part of it. Awesome. So I just I just want to say that among the, that first generation also is this Beto O'Rourke guy. You might psychedelic warlord. Yeah. Psychedelic warlord 2020 make America K Rat again. <laughs> and um, and uh, Kevin Kevin Wheeler. Uh, I don't know if you Swamp, Swamp Rat. Rat. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the sorry main. sorry Grandmaster Rat. Grandmaster he, he was Rat. promoted. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so that's that's the beginnings in Texas. Um, another very key early member um, is Jesse Jesse Dryden, um, Mr. Drunk Fucks. Yeah, we could, we're, we're we're at DefCon. We can say his handle. It's Drunk Fucks. Um, 
so he started uh, HoHoCon, which was the first hacking convention to bring in, uh, you know, to invite the press and, and the cops so they didn't have to go to the trouble of uh, pretending to be hackers and uh, secretly <laughs> like trying to recruit snitches and, and bust people. Um, uh, so, uh, when Misha, you, you went to, uh, you went to early ho-ho cons. Um, so did Jeff Moss, some guy, he got some ideas from there, I, I've heard. Um, so, uh, take us back to early ho-ho cons. What, the, what, what was the significance of getting together in person with all these people you only knew on BBSs? Sure. So, um, the, the first hacker conventions were like summer con, and they were, um, invite only. So, if you happen to be users on privileged BBSs that, particip that, that uh, participated in um, uh, SummerCon, you would find out about the invite. It would be in St. Louis um, in, during some summer months when school was out. And, Possibly uh, at the same time as a, as a swinger convention. Uh, the, that's a different story, yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a swinger convention angle to this as well. Um, anyway, so the, the original... Several of us were really confused when we showed up at some of these early conventions going, is this what hacking is? And hijinks ensued. <laughs> yeah. there, so the original hacking conventions were, were invite only, right? So these were private affairs. Uh, hackers were going to talk amongst themselves, and of course they wouldn't want journalists or certainly law enforcement there to record everything that was going on, even though they probably were there from the very beginning. Um, when Drunk Fucks started HoHoCon, um, he, the, his first uh, attempt at HoHoCon was also invite only, um, but then somebody found out about it um, and they let the um, Howard Johnsons know that there was going to be a bunch of hackers descending over Christmas time uh, at their hotel, and Howard Johnson's had a fit about this, and they canceled the contract. And so, um, uh, and, and it became public that there was going to be a bunch of hackers somewhere in Houston over the summer, the, the Christmas vacation. And uh, Drunk Fucks famously sent out this message to, uh, on BBS, CDC BBS is saying, Hojo's says no, no to ho, ho. <laughs> um, and so kind of out of that, he said, he said, screw it. Why don't, let's, we're going to have another convention somewhere else. We'll, we'll find some other hotel to go to. Um, and this time we'll just invite, uh, law enforcement and we'll invite the FBI and we'll invite journalists. Maybe they'll show up. Maybe they won't. Um, and uh, so this was uh, the, the, one of the first hacker conventions that was sort of open to the public. And many of the things that people uh, take for granted uh, as features of DEF CON and Black Hat were, were actually pioneered at HoHoCon. So they, uh, spot the Fed. Why would you spot the Fed? Because we're inviting them to this convention and they're trying to fit in. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones with the crew cuts <laughs> and they're burly looking and they look uncomfortable being there and it's easy to spot them, right? So HoHoCon invented the Spot the Fed contest. Um, they invented um, selling t uh, hacker t-shirts in order to recoup costs for the convention. That was a big, so swag. Merchandising, yeah. merchandising, merchandising. It was a big thing. Um, capture the flag was something else also pioneered at HoHoCon. And so one. these, this, this HoHoCon was this um, uh, kind of critical in, in computer security history for pioneering all these, these things sort of incidentally uh, that, that have become staples of security conventions generally or Black Hat and DEF CON specifically now. So I also, like, a couple other quick things on that. One is that Texas is kind of big. And, um, it, you know, in Boston or New York, hackers could get together uh, more easily. So you sort of ne you needed, like, an organized event to get people there. And I think um, the, the personal relationships that developed that you can only do in person um, instead of just online, make, made a big difference in sort of the CDC's trajectory. Yeah. I mean, you could actually trust each other. You're right. Um, right. Which has not been true of many other hackers. And, and that was one of the effects of, of SummerCon, um, in, in that you got to meet Taron King, Nightlining, all these hackers that you looked up to who were, who were on BBSs that you called. But again, it was, very, it was invite only. It was a very, very small, select, um, elite, if you will, group. Uh, the number of people who attended SummerCon was like less than 50, maybe 50 people. Um, and then at, at um, HoHoCon, um, it, it was, again, open to the public. It started out with, you know, a, maybe more than 50 people and then grew and grew and grew. Um, but it, but for, for CDC, um, it was the first um, time that, that most of us could meet each other, right? So I, I was living in Boston. I knew the Boston crew. I knew the, the folks who would later, uh, the Boston people who would later join, uh, um, be inducted into CDC, 
the people who had later formed the loft. But I, that's all I knew. I didn't know this, the CDC people in Texas. I didn't know them in uh, Wisconsin, Chicago. I didn't know them anywhere else. And so when Drunk Fucks put on HohoCon, this was an opportunity not just to meet other hackers that, that I looked up to, but it was a, an opportunity to meet other hackers in CDC, uh, other, other people in CDC that, that I had looked up to or that I had communicated with but ne had never ever met. So that, that was important to us as well. I could say, you know, for me, it was, again, as you say, you know, it's like you're meeting your friends for the first time. You're meeting the face behind the monitor. Mm -hmm. And especially back then, that was a really big deal. So uh, another thing that, that makes CDC different from other groups of the time, and, you know, CDC wasn't the first. It's just, you know, it's the survivor of them all. Some of the others were, were more, most of them in the beginning were more technical. Right, you people who are actually breaking into stuff a lot and, and writing about it on, on, on bulletin boards, perhaps unwisely. Um, whereas CDC it sort of came out, it's like the liberal arts wing of the hacker underground, you know, started with the text files. And not everybody was an engineer or a future engineer. You know, uh, some people were more about the, you know, social issues or the writing itself. Um, and, and I think that actually allowed CDC to survive when others would get rounded up from time to time. Um, so, Mudge, um, tell us a little bit about uh, about the loft. Uh, and before before you go there, for those of you who don't know, there's there's substantial overlap between the loft, um, which I assume you all know about, uh, and CDC. Uh, four members um, lifetime that were were in both, including the two gents at the end there. Um, loft pioneering hackerspace told Congress what was what in 1998. Thank you for that. Um, uh, but the loft and CDC had an interesting dynamic, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. So bring, educate folks on uh, a little bit about the loft and how you came, came into it. Sure. So um, CDC, when they asked me to join, uh, I was already in the loft, uh, I believe, at the time. And what was interesting is they were making this transition from being a bit more of this sort of, I'm, I mean, we've always been like the, the crown jesters. Uh, uh, but exactly. they, they wanted a bit more of a technical sort of presence uh, as they saw the field moving uh, and this sort of handoff to it. And they said, well, uh, do you have any, you know, like advisories or security, you know, write-ups that you could, you know, get, contribute to us that would, you know, move us in this particular direction? Uh, at the time, it was one on uh, S-Key uh, that I did. And I was like, of course. I mean, I, I was huge fans. And uh, Omega and White Knight were kind of the folks that I was hanging out with and I really looked up to. And, when they were willing to bring me in, it just, you know, it, it, it meant the world to me. But what I saw with the loft, because what, what we were doing with the loft and, and when Dill came in with the loft, is we really started going heavy, heavily into full disclosure and, and we're, you know, we're credited with kind of pioneering a lot of like what it became, the, the, the controversy, some of the animosity to it uh, as well. But it was all about um, we're going to bring transparency to some of these security problems uh, because big corporations, you know, on, I was working at um, Bolt Baranek and Newman, this little company called BBN, uh, which uh, you know, had created TCP IP and the internet uh, for DARPA many, many years ago. And I was like, I get to work here. This is fantastic. And they were starting to move over to Windows. And we saw a bunch of vulnerabilities there. And we went back to Microsoft. So this was, you know, the Department of Defense and government contractors. And Microsoft was at that point where they were becoming so large that, you know, the U.S. government and other governments really couldn't influence them. There was a no. bigger sort of market for them to play to. Um, and so they said, we don't care. Uh, they literally, you know, that was kind of the response. It's not a security problem unless, you know, it's, it's affecting our bottom line. Uh, and I went to Tad Elmer, who was the CEO at the time. Uh, actually, it might have been George Conradis. I, I get him flipped around. Uh, and I said, hey, you know, I'm with the loft and this hacker group, and they're like, we have no clue what you're talking about, whatever. I'm like, um, I think I can get them to respond uh, if, you know, if I do some things, but it's not associated with this company. So we started pushing, you know, vulnerability disclosure and uh, advisories. And so we started giving proof and exploit code and proof of concept um, because Microsoft could no longer say, that's not a problem, that's just theoretical. Yeah. Uh, you know, because now everybody could do it. And they started to move in response. Um, now, that was actually with the, one of the loft uh, slogans was making the theoretical practical since yes. 1992. So <laughs> that's where that really came from. Yep. So. And, and the, the really fa fascinating part with uh, CDC, because CDC had this sort of like bad cop, 
And the way I was trying to help uh, prop the loft up for like, a, a, you know, a, like, I don't, I don't want to call it brand recognition, but like where we came across was, you know, this sort of like neutral cop uh, sort of setup. And we yeah. were doing the same thing. And here I got to play both sides and say, if we release uh, an advisory through Cult of the Dead Cow, and if we release the same sort of information through the loft, it's the same message, just packaged differently, coming from a different source, and it got a very different reception. Yeah. Uh, and it was fascinating. So BO, uh, which you're going to hear about, you know, Back Orifice and Back Orifice 2K, you know, came across one way, and we, we played to see if something's released and it has a negative spin, can you ever claw it back? And if something releases with a somewhat neutral or positive spin, does, you know, does it become perturbed? So it became this great sort of like culture jamming, like uh, Petri dish to really mess around with. And so, I mean, I, I was in love. So I, I, just, I just think one of the really incredible things going back and looking at this whole history is that, you know, at the time, you know, hackers were still, you know, they were sort of coming into their own in the late 90s. They, you know, were really starting to get attention. Uh, people were concerned. People were interested. They were vaguely threatening. Um, they were a little scary. And despite, like, the pedigree of the people at the loft, um, the way to actually make change was to be, like, cartoonishly villainous. Mm -hmm. You know, so yep. Grandmaster Rat here on, on, on the stage pacing up and down, rapping uh, with gold, gold chains and rabbit fur chaps and throwing CDs into the crowd. Literally igniting his crotch on fire it, with flash it, it powder. happened more than once, yeah. I think. Not, not recommended. No. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, that generated media. That, you know, that got the cameras. Oh, yeah. And, and sure Microsoft, you know, when somebody from NBC or ABC or whatever <laughs> sticks a, a microphone in Microsoft's face and is like, well, what are you going to do about these evil hackers that are going to allow anybody to hack anything? You know, they, then they actually have to come up with an answer. So, mm -hmm. so back orifice came first by Sir Distic, uh here in uh, 90, uh, 90s, 98. 98, thank you. Um, and uh, so that was the widely distributed Trojan. Um, and uh, after that, Microsoft could have said, yeah, you're right. We really need to build in some security with TCP IP. Um, but instead, they said, you know what? It's not a problem at all. But if you're really concerned, yeah, if you're really concerned, uh, then you can upgrade to uh, Windows NT or Windows 2000. Yeah, 2000. So they, they used it as an opportunity to upsell. So I, at that point, I probably would have given up. Um, but instead, CGC brings uh, Dildog here into the picture and has him write BO2K. So what, what were you trying, why, why didn't you give up? And how was BO2K like more, more of a poke at Microsoft than BO? Um, well, um, the BO2. And, and were you independently wealthy? I mean, how, did you, how could you do this? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's begging the, my answer here. Um, I got involved uh, with Loft through just random social connections. Uh, so like 1994 is when I uh, went to MIT and started to uh, kind of get the sense that um, there was some hacker culture there um, and got very interested in, in the whole field of security. Um, I met the Loft folks in 96 uh, when I went to DEF CON 4, uh, which is now 23 years ago. Um, and uh, we decided that we needed to talk some more after they had seen some of the stuff that I was doing. So we ended up, um, you know, I ended up becoming the first employee of the loft, actually, in, I believe, 97. Uh, so uh, working on loft crack and things like that, bringing in some revenue into the loft uh, so that I didn't have to do my day job, which at the time was just working at a bank. Uh, you know, I told my mom, yeah, I'm going to quit my day job at the bank that I worked <laughs> four years at MIT to do. And, uh, and I'm going to go work with a bunch of hairy hackers in a warehouse and make no money until uh, we sell a bunch of copies of a password cracker. And um, <laughs> yeah, they, she was like, you better know what you're doing. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is great. Uh, and then he saw my code, and he's like, I have no oh clue what I got Oh, my God, I'm going to fix this shit. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, um, right. so, you know, we, we got Loft Crack out there, and um, I was searching for other things to do, saw Back Orifice was very uh, inspired. I, I was just like, wow, uh, the notion of remote control and remote administration of Windows systems was kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, back in 96, hacking Windows was considered extremely lame. Nobody was hacking Windows because systems were not, like, no one was using Windows NT for anything important. It was all like the, the, the Solaris and the Ultrix and all this other, you know, 
big name Unix brands that uh, were cool to hack, and Windows was not cool to hack. Um, so I, you know, naturally gravitated toward this because I saw it becoming a big deal, and you know, published a lot of buffer overflow exploits and things like that, and got really deep into system programming uh, and kernel programming. And uh, when I realized how um, expressive and verbose and ridiculously broad the Linux, uh, sorry, Linux, <laughs> so I've been doing that too lately, um, the Windows kernel was, um, it realized that you could do so much as a regular user, like so much that you could get away with, um, you know, opening up threads inside other processes that you didn't start and then, uh, you know, injecting code into them and then running extra threads in those process spaces. I mean, there's just, the, the amount of stuff you could get away with was so big that uh, the, I wouldn't call it a tax service, but the, your ability to uh, create extremely creative programs that did things that nobody expected uh, was completely supported by the OS, and it, and it wasn't. There were no um, there were no exploits required. It's like that's why I'm here. Yeah, there were no exploits required to write back Orifice 2000. It was just the design of the thing was so um, security unaware that you could get away with doing amazingly like uh, unprotected things uh, uh, and and surreptitious things. Uh, completely within the bounds of the security, uh, uh, you know, um, designs of, of Windows, so. Yeah, I mean, it actually gave you, it gave the, the person remotely more control, more control of the computer than you had yeah, I mean, sitting it, at it. It was yeah. faster to use BO2K to do administration than it was to do it using the, your own mouse, uh, you know, a keyboard. <laughs> Um, in, in fact, we you even released a, a professional pack. Uh, the later. Loft, yeah, Loft had it had its own uh, commercial BO2K plugin set that no one bought. Um, <laughs> Well, it, it was also free, I think. Uh, <laughs> but they no, still didn't no, buy it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, maybe, the, maybe we did give it away. Um, <laughs> but it was, yeah, like a remote file browser and a registry editor and things like that. that we wanted to have parity with remotely possible and all the other, uh, like, you PC know, PC anywhere. anywhere yeah, yeah. Like that. yeah, this this is a legitimate tool, well, which, again, kind of goes back to I, the, I do know at least a, a few people that used it legitimately. It's, uh, I, I mean, you know, I was the person who was getting the email, and I got emails all the time from people like, hey, yeah. I'm in the Navy, and we use this to administer like, all the, all the uh, machines so, in our lab. And, so you know, speaking of which, for folks who aren't aware, just a little context of what, what Dill actually did with BO2K, and actually Sardista kind of pioneered with it, was every one of the major implants that you see today, the core functionality can literally be traced back to this. And I've actually got the history on both sides to say it can be traced back to this. Yeah. Uh, so it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was fun. <laughs> Thanks. Um. Uh, yeah, so yeah, BO2, BO2K was a big deal. I was I, I had a, a lot of fun writing it. Um, you know, my my challenges were making it nice and small and compact. Um, you know, I you know wrote it without libc. Um, so you know, in comparable tools were you know megabytes and tens of megabytes of size. It was like 160k or something total when compiled. So really tiny. Uh, you know, just some of the technical challenges there. I had a real fun time with the with the Windows kernel, and uh, it was. Uh, I don't know. I, am I even answering the question you asked, Joe? <laughs> I, I just love it. Let me show. add, just as, as a side note, we actually thought about selling BO2K for a dollar. Um, so as a, as a remote administration tool, it competed with um, Symantec, PC Anywhere, PC Anywhere. PC Anywhere, and some other stuff. If you remote were running possible, an antivirus yeah. app, it did not detect PC Anywhere. Even though or, it did exactly the same thing. Or any of these other commercial utilities even though you could trick somebody into installing that and using it just like BO2K. It did not, uh, antivirus vendors did not detect those commercial programs because it would be restraint of trade, right? Um, they're making money off of it and you're basically depriving them of money. And so for a short time, we thought about actually, well, we could get um, antivirus vendors to not detect BO2K if we sold it for a dollar. Um, and so about why we didn't sell it? <laughs> you can talk about that. No, why don't you, why don't no, you no, talk about you go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so, uh, to set the stage, uh, you know, at, at the time, uh, crypto was was a munition as far as the, the U.S. government was concerned. Right. And one difference between BO and BO2K is that we wanted strong encryption. We wanted meaningful encryption um, because I guess it, did we, was it just XOR in in a, in, in, in in the original back yeah, orifice, yeah, whereas yeah, twice, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was ROT twenty six. So, uh, and what what was it? What 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 did you use in, in BO2K? Um, and BO2K had a pluggable architecture, so you could plug in different okay. crypto yeah, systems. Yeah, but by, it, came by with, it came with triple DES by default. Yeah, triple DES. And, and there, people wrote, um, you know, Blowfish and AES yeah. uh, 
it rained all before it was AES. Uh, so, but, but part of this is because encryption crypto was considered a munition, we we're like, well, people are going to be downloading this from all over the world. We assume, well, how do we handle that? So we actually hired a, a lawyer. Um, it was a, are we allowed to say? Yeah, sure. Oh, yes, yeah. We're allowed to say. Uh, Cindy Cohn, who's yeah, yeah. now with, with the EFF. Yeah, with the EFF. EFF. Um, so we, you know, we retained a lawyer and said, hey, we want to do this. Um, how much jail are we going to go to? Um, and <laughs> that was a really frequent thing on the mailing list. Yes, yeah. it, was. it was. Yeah, it yeah. really was. Um, and so, you know, basically she said, uh, don't sell it. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a totally different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, you have to at least make a, make a, a a different version without the uh, the triple des right. available, and you can say, <laughs> "Hey, if you're in, if you're outside the United States, download this one instead." Right. Kind of thing. Right. Right. To, right. to so, give an example, sorry. If, if so I can so we, we. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say off the the one part of the. It was a really common sort of like how you know how many how much how many years of jail are we going to serve yeah. for this? <laughs> um, yeah. The back and forth between Loft and CDC for the exact same sort of thing, with the crypto as a munition sort of thing. Yeah, we even set up during this time period, we were like, hey, wait a second. In the loft, we actually went and started to get our license to manufacture uh, firearms and high capacity and everything else because we found a loophole in the crypto law that says once you are a manufacturer of munitions, we were, of so munitions well. and you have a and license munition. for munitions, you can do crypto. And anybody <laughs> could go get a storefront on the Charles River or anything else, sell a prototype into some military or you know, government agency of like, eh, it's got like a little less flashbang or something on it or whatever, and you got this license, and then all of a sudden you could do crypto back and forth. So we were trying to show that it was this sort of like, you know, loophole and it really was a false flag mm -hmm. and it was really this red herring sort of setup. And that was the beautiful part about the loft and the CDC is that we could see this thing on each side and go, hey, wait, we figured this out here. Okay, well, yeah, but they view us as X. Well, let's try it as Y. Oh, look, they view us as Y. Okay, well, bounce it back over to X. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I want to do some, some at stake now. Um, so the industry is rapidly evolving. Um, Microsoft brings, uh, and AOL bring the internet to everybody, and CDC and the loft suggest that maybe they ought to put in some security as well, so they get around to that a little bit. Um, but it's 99, 2000, people are making all kinds of money. Uh, and why not try to try to go pro? So um, uh, thus, Loft takes some venture money and becomes uh, becomes at stake, um, which lasts lasts about five years. So some really amazing things happened at at stake. Um, some things didn't work out so well. Uh, Would you guys uh, talk a little bit about uh, the at stake at stake experience? Oh. I'll lead it off, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I'm the one who got us into that morass. <laughs> that mess. Um, I, I say that there was some really awesome stuff that yeah, came out. No, you can was... trace almost, I mean, you can trace a lot of really uh, influential people, influential organizations, uh, Alex Stamos, uh, Dave Goldsmith, you know, uh, Matasano. You know, it, 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 there was a lot of good that came out of it. Um, there was a lot of like, you know, Katie Masuris and Windows Snyder. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Um, uh, Veracode, yeah. Yep. Cetera, a, lot of, a lot of technologies and uh, people uh, started amazing things after Rat Stakes. So. Um, now, for the loft, it, it was kind of like a defining moment, moment after we had gone from a hobby group uh, into something with a direction and a mission uh, into something that ultimately, you know, was a lot of friction uh, mm -hmm. in other areas. And what we had wanted to do was we wanted to turn, you know, we, we loved our hobbies uh, and we all had day jobs for it. Uh, and a couple of the things that I had written and that, you know, Weld contributed to or whatever made enough money that we were able to bring in our first, you know, paid employee uh, for it. And we're like, well, wait a second, you know, how can we kind of go pro such that we can do what we love rather than what we're doing during our day jobs because we don't necessarily all love our day jobs. What we didn't understand at the time was kind of like how the VCs, you know, seem to align with us but maybe didn't uh, entirely. Um, but, you know, that, and, and, you know, it sounded good. Uh, and, yeah. you, know, that, that, you know, some hard knocks came. But um, it, it, it turned out to be a really interesting complex system. And any time there's, there's a complex system, you know, there's a lot to be learned there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, the divestiture and the different branches that spread out from it, like Veracode, that came from the loft all the way through at stake, yeah. incubated it at stake, um, and a lot of other ones were very positive. Let's hear about Veracode. Um, Veracode's early uh, beginnings were uh, a decompiler effort that I had started in 1999 at the loft. 
Um, I had been doing a lot of reverse engineering by hand, uh, found that much of what I was doing was very repetitive, and I wanted to build a tool that would help me do it faster. Um, so uh, I found a, a very early decompiler uh, research paper by Christina Sifuentes from the Queensland University of Technology, read through that. Um, it's the same research paper that, um, you know, uh, resulted in things like hex rays and Ghidra and things like that. Um, so I, I was one of the first to really go through this paper and, and find um, uh, ways to enhance what, what had been done there to produce high-level models of uh, low-level binaries. Um, and we got funding through At Stake to continue to do that research while I was there. Um, I mean, At Stake had a very vibrant research team, which was the Loft, plus some other folks that we hired along the way. Um, and the, the safe <laughs> decompiler, which used to be called the UDS, which was the Undeveloper Studio. Um, also uh, named after a contraceptive no, device. No, no, yes. no. Uh, I, I, no. Uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> it was the Loft. There it was, was the Loft. We, we had a lot of bad jokes in there. Um, so I, I ended up um, sort of shepherding that IP One through two. At Stake. Um, getting some employees, you know, building a product, and eventually uh, when it got sold to Symantec, we basically had no way of um, uh, keeping that project alive unless we found a way to spin it out. Um, Symantec wasn't going to do anything with the decompiler. We, we talked to some of their executives and they were like, it's a C++ thing, we don't do C++ anymore. And we were like, huh? Well, apparently Symantec had a C++ compiler that they had been selling for a while, it was actually to compete with Borland. To compete with Borland, it was Symantec C++. So when they stopped doing that, they just kind of looked at what we were building on paper and said, "No, we don't do C++ anymore." And they they basically let Veracode walk right out the door. Um, so you know, we got some venture capital, um, proceeded to get it funded, and built a company, um, the first to do binary analysis of things that were, you know, not necessarily on your desktop, but sent to you across the internet. You know, people wouldn't send source code for analysis across the internet because it was con generally considered to be too valuable uh, to let out the door, but they'd be willing to ship your binaries because they're going to ship those anyway, so there was a business model there. You know, you could Chris, do a, a service. So. So we, we have like 10 minutes, so yeah. I won't be. Sure, yeah, yeah, I can just keep We talking haven't got to hackerism. Uh, okay, so Misha, um, Omega, uh, talk to us about, uh, so we got, we got awesome stuff in the private sector. You, you can take my word for it if you don't know that Mudge did amazing stuff in the government sector. Um, Tell us a little bit about um, Oxblood Ruffin's entry into the group uh, and the sort of like the birth of hacktivism and um, mm. how it's evolved since. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to have to share some of the story with Luke, I think. I can say that the way that Oxblood uh, introduced himself to us is by sending me an email insulting Count Zero. And <laughs> that was enough to be, he was like, I love all you guys except that fucker of Count Zero. I was like, what? What did Count Zero do to you? So he came at, it, uh, at us in this, kind of, again, like, like Luke said, in this kind of uh, uh, strange, strange way and um, I developed a conversation with a couple of, of CDC members and we ended up meeting him at uh, DEF CON one year. And he, he basically came at us uh, almost on day one with a pitch. Um, you guys are pranksters and um, jesters um, and you have the stage a little bit. Uh, have you thought about doing anything more substantial with the media that you can get or with the, the attention you can get? Have you ever thought about doing anything more than with, with that? And um, I think my response is, why can't we have both? Yeah. Um, you know, por que no los dos? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we, we, we ended up inducting um, uh, uh, Oxblood into CDC eventually. Um, and he brought a different... He, he definitely brought a, a different perspective. Different sensibility. A different sensibility. He um, had a background um, working at the United Nations. He clearly had a, a like a marketing um, background to him. He had a marketing head to him. Um, he um, kind of pushed us in certain directions for branding or messaging. Um, and he, ha he kind of brought um, uh, uh, sort of a social... Um, Consciousness, yeah, to, to, to CDC. Um, and this is around the time when um, the, the, the Great Firewall of China started happening and China was um, starting to expand out into the rest of the world. Um, and uh, for various personal reasons, he had a, an interest in China. 
and uh, we kind of, for, for various uh, uh, current event reasons and, and also because this is sort of his pet peeve, uh, we kind of focused on China as um, uh, just a focus of attention. And uh, China became um, kind of a, uh, a reason for trying out different ideas and hacktivism became one of them. All right. So I just um, just to make sure that we hit a couple things uh, before questions. Oh, and I forgot to say earlier, we're all going to sign books uh, at 4:15 in the vendor area in uh, in uh, in Bally's. Um, before you break off, I mean, you can't go from China without talking about Slobodan Milosevic and the CDC being in the. I just wanted to, I just wanted to hit a couple things. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so one of the great things that they did is they had a hacktivism uh, panel here at, here at DEF CON uh, a couple years later, and Patrick Ball uh, was like actual practitioner technologist in the field working on human, human rights, compiling databases, making sure they're compatible. And so he cross-referenced, uh, you know, the, the Army officers, you know, where they were with when the most human rights abuses happened and, you know, come up with the worst abusers and then try and get them fired. He, he went after uh, Slobodan Milosevic, and, uh, who served as his own defense attorney at The Hague, and there is a great exchange uh, where S Slobodan Milosevic asked Patrick Ball, you know, what is your affiliation with this uh, dead cow cult? Um, you can find, Luke? You, yeah. You, yeah. You can find the video on The Hague website. Yeah, if, if you, so if you, when we saw that, it, it was just like, uh, that's crazy, and I'm not sure I like the fact that this, you know, genocidal dictator knows who we are. <laughs> yeah. It's you, the International Criminal Court of former, former Yugoslavia. If you search the transcripts for Cult of the Dead Cow, you will come up with many, many hits where we're referenced. Yeah, Ratko Mladic, like it, yeah, it yeah. 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 more than once. So, you, so, you know uh, you've arrived as a hacktivist organization when you're name checked in a war crimes tribunal. Not yeah. once, <laughs> but three times. Three times. Wow. So, uh, so among among the um, among the influences and impact of, of the group in this in this sort of this tranche of it was Tor. Uh, so, Oxblood and friends uh, tried to do privacy protecting browser, which in turn convinced Dingledine to put a browser into Tor, which seemed like a pretty good idea in retrospect. Um, they all Na Navy had something to do with that earlier, also. <laughs> no, I mean Navy first, and then it's, and then it spun off, and then they're like, hey, that's a good idea. We should adopt that. Yeah. Um, and uh, they had a, a significant influence in the early days of the Citizen Lab. Uh, were awesome people at the University oh, yeah. of Toronto who track governments using malware against their own citizens. Uh, so. Uh, that lives on. So I, I think we ought to go go to questions, or we're not going to get to uh, get to any. Um, so I forget how this works. We have mics. Does anybody know? If you don't have mics, just scream and whoever. Uh, yeah, I was thinking, just you know, write shower. write your questions on twenty dollar bills <laughs> and just bring them up. Some things never change. <laughs> So uh, I will restate it because uh, th this, is, this needs amplification, which is you're looking at a panel of really white guys from a middle class sort of uh, situation and where the hell is the diversity? And there was diversity there, so why isn't the diversity here now? Did, did I catch that correctly? Uh, Lady Caroline didn't want to come. <laughs> um, uh, but I will be seeing her this weekend. But no, this, this is really, really important, and, and, and this, uh, thank you, because it's one of the things that we actually really cherished, and it's one of the things that Beto O'Rourke really brought in, because yeah, he, he was one of the earliest CDC. people, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to push for this, he was an early CDC member, but he was the one that, even back then, wanted diversity, and wanted to bring in, like, different sorts of opinions, and it was something that we really cherished at the Loft, and the Loft was very white as well, uh, and all male uh, as well, we had Mega Hacker, and we actually had Ada, and everybody yeah, else. More. But uh, it's one of these things where we loved challenging each other. We liked the fact that people came up from different backgrounds, from different understandings, with different experiences and stuff, and we were all frustrated that our experiences weren't different enough. And if you are running a security group or if you are working with different people and you look around and everybody looks like you, you're not good defenders and you're not good hackers because 
where you get the different ideas and the different perspectives and how to challenge what you're looking at is from diversity. The more diverse the team you have is, the better you are at finding the vulnerabilities, seeing things differently. So either you become the old guard and you say, no, nobody else joins, or you become the old guard and you say, I welcome the diversity, let's move forward. Thank you. One more question. The Ikes. So the, the, the comment was we didn't uh, talk about the testimony of the Congress uh, and, and what that meant. Uh, and real briefly, I mean, that was, uh, you know, CDC actually helped prop that up. There was a lot, I mean, we wouldn't have had the publicity and the recognition for the loft to do it otherwise. There was a lot of uh, behind the scenes. I was working with the National Security Council. Uh, and Joe actually mentioned something that I thought was kind of interesting because he said, you know, we should talk about testifying to Congress and how that wasn't enough. Uh, and, you know, it's like, it was almost like, and I, I took this, I was like, oh, that hurts because it's not like we thought we were going to fix the problem. But testifying to Congress, and, and it took a lot of convincing to get the loft and the other folks to go there, was to open the door, to show that there can be a communication between two different groups that don't see eye to eye, and maybe never should see eye to eye, but have certain things that they're okay with together, and actually, you know, work things out and understand each other and build sensitivities. Um, so I really view that as that's what CDC to me means, it's what the loft to me means, it's what I did in CFT at DARP and everything else, which is I want to open the door, everybody else can take it further because that's what I wish had happened to us back then. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I uh, hope to see you at the signing and, uh, and it's good to be back. Thanks everybody. If, uh, if anyone's interested, I have a very limited number of uh, 35th anniversary CDC challenge coins for sale. And if you want one, just pick me up.